That's good. Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Nancy Dressel. I'm the president elect of the Literacy Task Force of Wisconsin, and I'm filling in for Donna Heitmanic tonight, who is enjoying some vacation. I've enjoyed visiting with Aaron for the last few minutes, and I'm very excited for you guys to have your uh, sixth and final uh, book study night. And so I will keep an eye on the chat to let Erin know if there's any questions coming up. Otherwise, she'll have some time for you um, at the end for some questions and discussion. And I look forward to you enjoying your learning tonight. Thank you, Nancy. You're welcome. So I should put this up. Oh, I need to share my screen. I'm always forgetting these things. So thank you everyone for coming again. And um, it's been it's been really exciting to do this with all of you. And I hope that you've been learning a lot and working with your students. And we can talk about that at the end, of course. But we better jump into it because I always have a lot to say. And <laughs> tonight is no exception. So I hope that you got a chance to delve into the uh, chapter five lessons that we went over in the last two sessions. Um, and I also hope that the simplicity of the language and of the lesson presentations um, haven't obscured for you the depth that's there and the richness of the approach that's there. Uh, people look at it and they think about what's missing um, you know, there's no rules in there, and um, they often can't see what really is there. And I think part of it is the simplicity of the language that we use with the kids that was actually quite carefully crafted for their benefit. Um, the simplicity of the language and the lesson presentation makes the, I think, things sometimes so on first glance look simplistic. But if you got a chance to do all of those lessons as they're described, I think that you're going to really um, have some revelations with your students. And if you haven't done them already, I, I encourage, encourage you to really just give them a try and do what I did when I was first trained in the method. I did the lessons exactly as they were described as an experiment before making up my mind about what would and wouldn't work. You know, I had worked for 10 years in another reading methodology and all of a sudden these things were looking very different. And I, I as a linguist, I looked at things and thought, oh, you know, that's not, I wouldn't do it that way. Um, but I tried the experiment and I'm glad that I did. So in fact, I thought I would share with you the, the results of one of my very first experiments with the method. I was working uh, at a local uh, elementary school with fifth graders. So those would be year six if you're in um, the UK. And these students were getting ready to move on to the next level of school. And their teachers identified them as ones that they were worried about. They didn't think would be successful as they moved on into middle school. So they, they identified 15 of their lowest readers and I worked with them in groups of five and met with them an hour at a time. We aimed for three times per week. We only got in eight weeks because we started, I think, in after, after um, spring break. And there's a whole lot of things that happen at the end of the school year, including school testing and science trips and all these things. So we got an average of 10 hours of instruction in with the students. And the, the gains that we got really floored me. You know, I, I did the instruction, but the principal was the one who did the testing. And I'm glad she did, because I don't know if um, people would have believed me. <laughs> uh, in those 10 hours with those kids working in groups of five, with me newly trained and not, you know, not very efficient yet, I don't think, and making lots of mistakes, I know from looking back at what I did, those students gained on word identification, which is reading real words, they gained over a year in, in their ability to do that. And then on word attack, which is 
attacking new words they've never seen before, nonsense words, they gained nearly three years. And it was amazing to me to see what happened when I did it. But these results are actually quite typical of what practitioners in a clinical one-on-one -on -one setting can expect um, from working um, in phonographics with students. And I wanted to point out that in this experiment, I tried to follow the lessons exactly as I was trained, follow the pacing exactly as I was trained, and just to see what happened. And so in following that, we started with some of the adjacent consonant work um, just for the first like session, first part of the session. And then we jumped right into the advanced code, which is the chapter that we went over last week. And about halfway through our course, so about five hours into it, I introduced the multisyllable management that we'll be going over today. And we worked with both those levels, the advanced code and the multisyllable management for the rest of the time. And had we had more time for the course, if the school year hadn't run out on us, then um, I would have started doing fewer of the lesson plans and more of just reading and writing together. But I would be sure to be there so that I could be providing code information and error correction as they were reading books and as they were writing and trying to spell things. So my best takeaways from from that experiment, well, one was, wow, it, it works. <laughs> I, I don't see how or why for many aspects is what I was thinking at the time, but I knew at that point I could never go back to a rule-based approach that starts from print and goes to speech. My second biggest takeaway was that wow, this method is really clean. It's, it's pure in a scientific sense and very efficient. And I realized I had been spending so much time in the past, in instructional time on things that the reader really didn't need in order to make progress. Or we were spending it on things they didn't understand and it took too long to get them to understand it. The other takeaway was about the multisyllable management level that we're gonna look at. It's just as revolutionary in its approach as the advanced code is. And it was amazing to me to watch those students just take to it like ducks to water. They, they didn't seem like they were ready when it was time according to the pacing for me to introduce multisyllable management. I didn't think they were ready at all, and they certainly wouldn't have been in my previous method, but I was trying to stay true to my experiment, and I followed the pacing that I had just learned in my training like a, a month or two before that, and it was such a key for them. This is the multisyllable level is where everything came together for the students, things that had been mushy and I didn't think they were getting, it just all seemed to click and come together. And they took off with it and they were running with it. They were doing things I wasn't teaching them, right? They had to figure out how to make it work. And I think that is true of any of these methods that are starting from speech and going to print. We're realizing it's not really that difficult to teach kids to process by sounds. We don't need to do all these things, these crutches that other methodologies are trying to do, like work with blends and start with syllables and that sort of thing. Teaching them to process by sounds is perfectly doable. When we capitalize on their innate language knowledge and the way that they learn language, it all becomes pretty simple. I know one of the biggest refrains or most common refrains that I hear from folks who are looking at um, reading reflex and haven't delved deeply enough into all of the lessons as, as they're described to be done. One of the most common things they'll say is, don't you think the multisyllable management level needs to be fleshed out much more? And again, I think it's because kids are learning it and taking it we don't need to teach as much as we really thought we had. And it doesn't need to be as difficult as we thought it had to be. 
Um, but when you're looking at the lessons, you know, just and not really doing them with a student yet, it's hard to see that there's really a great deal of depth and richness to there to the, the level. When the students really understand what the lessons are designed to teach them, the few simple things they're designed to teach them, and the students are trained enough that they apply those things independently, you, you'll see them take on any kind of word. So let's jump into it. Let's start looking at those lessons. Uh, we don't have a ton of time today, I know. <laughs> I always run out. I can't run out this time. So um, I'll hit the highlights and for now to help you when you get to the point where you're ready to take this on with your students. But when we get to this lesson, these lessons, I want you to keep this in mind that all we really need to teach your child to manage these longer words, right? We just need to teach them to manage these longer words, articulating sounds in different syllables now. And by manage, I just mean blending, segmenting, and dealing with overlap, right? That's all we really need to teach them to do. So uh, a little warning to some of you reading teachers out there, you're gonna have a lot of unlearning and letting go to do here. So the issues, when we look at them, are, are fairly simple. There aren't that many. Multisyllable words are more than one mouthful of sounds. They, they can't be all articulated together. We stop the flow of blended sounds and start again with another set. But this is exactly what we do when we're reading from word to word. We're blending sounds and we stop, we blend sounds and stop, we blend sounds and stop, and the speech just flows together. We don't notice all these little chunks of sounds that words form, and we don't notice those little chunks of sounds that we're speaking multisyllable words in either. But if we don't teach children to manage this, they're gonna try to force all the sounds into one neat little blended set, and that just doesn't work they're gonna squeeze things out when they do that. So we need to teach them to manage it, but we need to be sure that we're true to the nature of the code. Um, we have to remember sounds are the raw material of our written words, not syllables. And many methods are gonna start segmenting it all, even at the very beginning, at the syllable level. That's the first thing they'll do. They'll give kids multi-syllable words and ask them to clap out syllables. And that's their sort of gateway into the sounds of our language. Um, and those methods are positing that it's easiest to break words up into syllables. But I think we'll find our students are already breaking so sound words into sounds, right? And now we just can move on forward into the, into the syllable level. And we, we don't wanna make the mistake done in many of those methods where they may not necessarily ever break syllables up into their individual sounds. And there's a lot of dangers in that. Dangerous because our code is a sound-based code, right? We don't have the luxury of saying, well, that's difficult, so we're not gonna do it. We have to develop methods based on the realities of our written language, right? And when we're reading, we aren't starting from any meaning yet. We haven't figured out the word yet, right? We're not starting from um, morphemes and meaningful chunks that they usually start with in the other methods and moving down. No, we're building up from sounds to syllables and finally to those meaningful units that we want students to get to, right? And we wanna be sure that we're working with the sounds always, because if we, if we don't draw kids' attention to the sounds within these syllables and we work just with syllables and we work with certain units with children, remember they get the idea that they must memorize the units. We, we had that with the, um, with the uh, consonant blends, right? That we don't want them to get the idea they have to memorize those groupings that's inefficient and it's too much of a, of a um, memory load. 
And there are far too many syllables in English to memorize. It, our, our language is not written with a syllabary. In Chinese, the language is completely different. The syllables that they speak are much simpler and fewer, and there's fewer possible syllables. So a syllabary is workful, workable for them, but we wanna make sure students of learning English never try to read by syllables only, okay? And we have to be sure that they don't confuse syllables with morphemes, okay? Morphemes are those little meaningful bits in the words, prefixes and endings and roots. And many methods will introduce the whole idea of syllables using those only, right? And students think that those are tied, syllables and morphemes. But not all syllables are meaningful bits on their own. In fact, many, 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 many are not. Children need to know how to blend sounds into syllables first, independent of the roots and the affixes, and then we move on to the meaningful parts inside the word. Okay. So the nature of our code that we and our, our language that we need to look at, these are our goals we want to accomplish with the lessons at the multisyllable level. Um, first is that kids understand that sometimes words have chunks of blended sounds inside them. It, it's interesting that these chunks we're talking about, these are spoken syllables, okay? Just the way that we speak a word. And linguistically, the timing and the voice inflection, et cetera, is the same as a, a single syllable word. But these chunks, they lack meaning and we don't mark them in the books with any spacing like we do between words. And importantly, children need to understand those are there, right? But we need to realize those children are already speaking in chunks. We just need to make them aware of them so that they can put them to use which is a very different approach, I think, than, than most uh, multi-syllable management in, in other methods. Um, not realizing children already do this. We just need to make them aware of what they're doing. Okay? And we're gonna use the term chunk with kids because it's more descriptive. And it's gonna make a distinction between what they'll learn in school about syllables, written syllables, okay? So once they understand our words have chunks in them, then we want them to understand that they can read multi-syllable words just by blending sounds into these spoken chunks that are flexible, and then take those chunks and get them into meaningful words or meaningful units. It's a, it's a simple process, right? And we don't wanna make it complicated. The, it's just simply that when you have a lot of sounds, the auditory memory gets overloaded unless we chunk up the, the um, sounds for them so they can hold on to them into neat little packages that make it easier to hold on to. But as we do this, we should realize that there are a few challenges that you have in a multi-syllable word. Some consonants don't really blend well together, and, but they need to be said one after the other. So this is like the mm and the n in containment, containment. It's sort of hard to go from the n to the m in the next syllable. And children will often lose one of those and maybe some sounds that are nearby, or they'll add a vowel to make it easier to say. So this is all part of our goal is to get them proficient enough to avoid errors like that, okay? Our next goal is, for them to understand that we can do the reverse process. We can spell multi-syllable words by breaking a word into these spoken little chunks and then take the chunks and break them into sounds. And I wanna point out there's a big typo on that page, on that, that goal. They actually repeated the, spell, the, the reading goal. This is how we, you wanna have the spelling goal. So if you have your book, you might wanna <laughs> note that, that this is the real goal for the spelling side. It's breaking a word into chunks and chunks into sounds. It's a simple direct process for mapping a word out as our first step when we spell. 
And in the lessons, you'll see how this process lays out and takes the student from the initial mapping that we'll do here into the accepted spellings, okay? Our next goal is that they understand, well, that multisyllable words contain a, a stronger chunk, one that's more dominant than the other. We have natural highs and lows in our words and readers need to manage it actually. Um, because you have to get the correct chunk accented or you won't hear the correct word. So there's a nice example in the book with the word button. If I'm looking at it and I'm trying to read it and I read ba and I read ton and then I put them together and I accidentally make ton dominant or accented, I would say baton, baton. And that doesn't sound much like the real word, does it? And the only thing that I'm doing wrong is accenting the wrong syllable. So we have to make readers aware of this and teach them to manage it. We'll just teach them about it and then teach them to try making other chunks a bit longer or stronger or louder when a word isn't making sense. When they've got baton, try making ba stronger. Button, oh, oh wait, then you can hear the word forming, right? Another goal we have at this level is for them to understand that there are weak vowel sounds in there. Some that are so weak, they're hard to identify. They're very reduced. It's a common and accepted part of our speech. And this is a speech to print approach, right? So your child's coming in and speaking with reduced and weak vowels. And it causes a spelling challenge. As your child's trying to segment words, they will often misspell words with these schwa sounds because they're so weak. So they're gonna need a management tool for that. Okay. And what we do is we teach children to make what we call a perfect recording. <clears throat> when they're looking at a word and they realize there's a schwa sound in there and they're thinking about spelling it later, we encourage them to say the word more clearly and cleanly and perfectly the way that it looks. Um, and then to remember to segment from that clear pronunciation when they spell it. This is a, a process that good spellers of English all do. You, you may not have ever reflected on the fact that you do it, but I bet that you use it um, even for words that, um, that have like a, a, a difference in pronunciation from their original spellings. And you're probably very familiar with those. And you do them with the schwa sounds, but you may not realize you do. But I bet you do with February, right? I have yet to come across people who can spell February correctly, who don't say it differently when they map it out in their head and say February, right? Same with Wednesday. I, I, I always ask my classes when, I, when we have the long, the full certification course and we have time, I always ask them to spell Wednesday for me. And I have never come across any teacher who can spell Wednesday correctly. And I've had some who can't spell it correctly, but all of them who spell it correctly say Wednesday as they map it out. So that's an example of a perfect recording. Those are almost exaggerated ones, but we need to do this for even a word like kitchen. If we've never seen it in print, print, kitchen, it would be hard to tell what vowel there is in that second chunk, kitchen, kitchen. And so as we read, we notice, oh, it's kitchen. And we sort of squirrel away these, these pronunciations, these auditory recordings for these words and use those when we spell. So that's the strategy we're gonna teach kids here. And we also need them to understand that many multisyllable words do have special endings. There are some of these endings that are not phonetically decodable and we won't overload. We, but we want to be careful. We're only going to teach the ones that are not phonetically decodable. We don't want to overload the visual memory by memorizing the, all the endings, the ones that are, are perfectly decodable, right? We're gonna work with sounds with them, 
But we are left with a very few that need to be memorized because they're not phonetically decodable easily. Um, there are only about eight or so of them. They're Latin and Greek borrowings. And they were just were never written in the English code. Where they still have strange elements. And when we have them reduced to just these few, children can easily memorize them. Visual memory works great here. So we're going to use that with these few. Okay. And these endings are usually meaningful in the word. They're morphemes, right? They, they bring meaning to it. So these are going to be our opportunity to introduce what we call morphology and get them thinking about endings. And we can start talking about prefixes and, and roots at this point with students. Okay. So how to proceed with this chapter? If you have a very young child, just watch in the word lists and it'll have sound doggy on there and pick those sound doggy word lists. And older children, you should keep working through the lessons until things are starting to get way too difficult. And then that might give you an idea of where to stop. A, a, a general rule of thumb is here though. If you have a second grader, um, that would be year three in the UK. They should be able to read and spell two syllable words at least. So you don't want to stop until they're managing those well in chunks. Okay. Third graders should be able to manage three syllable words. And older children need to be able to manage four syllables at least and focus on words whose meaning they know. Okay. They're going to learn to decode and encode well with these words and then be able to extend that to the, to the words that are new for them, okay? Okay, with all of these goals accomplished in the chapter, your children are gonna be primed to take on all the print around them now, okay? And while they're doing it, they're gonna be primed to focus on constructing meaning because they're not going to be focusing on rule application and memorization. They're not going to be focusing, focusing on anything but constructing the meaning now. Right? And they'll be able to benefit from the vocabulary and the comprehension development that they're going to be encountering at school. Right? So it's time for the lesson demonstrations. And it's perfect timing. My daughter just arrived. So, um, I can show you the lessons and then we'll um, talk about where we go after the multisyllable lessons. Sounded good? All right, so that means, and Nancy asked, can you briefly describe how you work with a small group? Definitely will. Um, I have that planned when we're, when we're um, finished with the multisyllable level, okay? Uh, so let me stop sharing this and switch to the other camera. There we go. And make sure this is on focus. Can you ready sandwich? Come on over. So the first lesson we're gonna come across in the book is the is reading and mapping multisyllable words with visual stops. And that's on page 307. Okay. And I've grabbed a word list for it. There, there were different ones to choose from. The one I chose for Sam has, um, has visual stops, just a little dash. Okay. Let me get this light going. Okay. So we're gonna be reading the words and putting them together. So Sam, up until this point, we've been sounding out to the end of the word and then putting it together. But a lot of words are much longer than that. They're more than one chunk of sounds. And so we have to learn to blend one chunk and then blend the next chunk and get those together to hear a word forming. So let's practice doing that with these words. These show us where to stop. So put this chunk together, what do you have? A and then, corn. Uh huh. And together? Acorn. Acorn. You got it. How about this one? Sample. Sample. Great. How about over here? Camping. Camping. Mm -hmm. Booklet. Booklet. Mm -hmm. Crayon. Crayon. Let's do one more. Crumble. Crumble. 
crumble. Beautiful. It gets really easy to read words if you read them in chunks. Now, I've noticed, Sam, many times, you'll read your first chunk, great, but the words aren't marked to show you where to stop, and you won't always look real closely at your second chunk. So I think it would be good practice to really read these and map them out and practice really looking at that second chunk, too. So why don't you read this word, word for me? What's the first chunk? Ta table table exactly when you first look at it it looked like it could be ta right mm -hmm. this is what's going to happen with these words over and over again because we have these things that can be more than one sound right? and you have no indication yet it's not a you might not know till the end right and you realize table is in the word but that can be a two and table is you manage that beautifully very nice job so what's the first chunk Okay, tay. tay, good. So um, what I want you to just map that out over here. A. Mm -hmm. That's tay. And your next chunk? B. O. Mm -hmm. And your chunks? Let's read them. Table. Table. All right. And you can see, I think Samantha probably doesn't need a lot more practice. Uh, and awareness that there are chunks in words, right? So I would be ready to move on with her. Sometimes the lessons are pretty quick and you can go from one to another. Um, so the lesson I wanna move on to her with is the next one in the book, which is multi-syllable word analysis. So here's where we're gonna have her take words that aren't broken up, right? and the sound pictures aren't shown, and she's gonna to have to analyze those herself. So let's read this first word. Uh, what do we Gopher. Have? It's gopher. So what's the first chunk? Go. Go. So I want you to say it sound by sound. G. And O. Oh. And if you end up, before you go, if you end up with a sound that's more than one letter, then put a line under it when you do it. So we're gonna do it sound by sound. So that's go. What's your next chunk? Gopher. And what sound is this one? Go. Oh, yeah, that one's underlined too. Very nice job. So we get go for. Great. How about that one? Hammer. So what's the first chunk you're going to do? Ham. Ham. Okay, let's hear it. And. I think there's more to your. Mm. Yes. Yeah. And what's the second chunk you hear? Uh, yeah, you've analyzed that great. Let's go over here. How about that one? What's the first chunk? Pear. Pear. Do it sound by sound. And there's more to it. Mm -hmm. Oh. Pear. Is this one sound? No. You were just underlining your chunk. Yeah. Okay. All right. I thought so. I thought you knew it was different. Very nice. Great job analyzing that one. Um, let's do one more so people can see how that one works. Let's read that one first. What do we have? Parade. Parade. And what's the first chunk? Pause. Uh, uh, Par. A. Yeah, you notice that separated picture in there. Nice, and that's what how we would manage that one in here. Very good. So let's read those chunks. Par it parade. Yeah, it's interesting. When you looked at it, you wanted to say par eight, didn't you? And I, I do too. I, I say it parade. Yeah, that's parade. Parade is a way of saying parade. it very carefully, isn't it? And we, I often do that when I'm spelling so that I can get all the sounds right. Because when we put this word together, this chunk gets really squeezed and really quick. Parade, parade. And it sounds almost like an er, doesn't it? Parade. And so good spellers are noticing when we say a word like that, kind of mushy, they're noticing what the word looks like in print and they use what they call a perfect recording to spell it later. So I might ask you for your perfect recording of parade later, okay? 
So what will your perfect recording be? Par A. Parade. Good. Nice. Actually, probably par aide. Parade. Yeah, you will you will need to remember that separated sound picture to spell that correctly, right? I probably wouldn't do that with a with a perfect recording. The perfect recording is more for those mushy parts of the words, I think, that you want to use it for. The other ones you want to get a good picture of in your mind, right? Almost like a camera. So yeah, so take a good look at that part. You do need to spell the A sound with this picture to get this word spelled correctly later. That's very good, very nice. So Samantha's already naturally doing what we're going to be teaching in the um, process spelling lesson that you'll see in a little bit. And I often do bring in things from the other multisyllable lessons as they become relevant and as I get comfortable with them. But that was multisyllable word analysis first. The next lesson, just to give you a taste of all these lessons, is finding the loud syllable. So, Samantha, I don't know if you've ever noticed, but when we say two chunks, one of the chunks is always stronger than the other one. And we just do it naturally. We don't have to think about it. That's part of knowing the word. So you know the word gopher, right? You know how to say it. And you naturally said gopher and made go the strongest chunk, right? But when you're reading it, there's nothing to show you to do that, not in English. In Spanish, they have one, they have a way to do that, but they don't do it in English. And sometimes when you sound out, you might sound out the wrong chunk strong. And then you'd get something like gopher, gopher. And it would be weird, yeah. And it'd be hard to hear the word, the correct word, right? So you wanna be flexible and ready to try one chunk strong and another chunk strong. Is it gopher or is it gopher, right? Which one sounds better? Gopher. Gopher, good. How about this word over here? Parrot. Parrot. Try making the other chunk stronger. Well, which chunk are you making strong first in parrot? Can you tell? Pear. Pear, exactly. So parrot. Try making the other one stronger. Parrot. Parrot, exactly. <laughs> it just doesn't sound right. So on the next ones, I'm just going to play a little bit. I'm going to read them the wrong way and see if you can hear the word for me. I'm not even gonna tell you which word I'm doing. Uh, let me see. Service. Service. Yeah, it's not service, it's service. How about husband? <laughs> She's looking at me strangely. Husband. Husband. Husband, <laughs> exactly. That's the idea. You just wanna be flexible. And if she had a lot of difficulty with this, we would work on it. But mostly I'm going to do this when she's trying to read a word and she's not hearing the right word. And I might tell her, oh, try a different strong chunk. All right. The next lesson is finding Mr. Schwa in multisyllable words. Do you know what a schwa is, Sam? Mm -hmm. What is a schwa? Um, I don't know how to explain it. Yeah, it's hard to explain, but we just saw one in in parade, right? Mm -hmm. It's a part of a word or that's really weak and hard to hear, right? So here's some words for us to look for. Talent. Talent, yeah. There's a schwa sound in talent. Talent. Where's the schwa sound? Ent. In the ent chunk, yeah, exactly. I mean, I say talent, but. You say talent? You know, when I first, was spelling this word, I thought it was tal, int, talent. That's what it sounded like to me, right? And then the first time I saw it in print, I went, oh, it's not talent, it's talent. I made a perfect recording for it. Okay. So let's practice doing that with a few of these words. I went through and I marked some that had schwa's just to make it easier for me. So what's this word? Target. Target, where is it weak? Target. Tar. Tar is actually the strong part of the word. Yeah. It's target. Yeah, which which sound would you say is the weakest one? The E. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this one right here. Tar. So what perfect recording could you make for this one? How would you want to say that? Target. Target, exactly. How about this word? Bishop. 
Bishop, yeah, where's the Schwarzen? You can support that we don't have to call out by letters. Bishop, where is it really root? Thing? Where might you get tricked in the spelling? Bishop. So you're looking for the thing you don't hear clearly. I think you're finding the strong chunk. Oh, I am. Right? Yeah, that's the part we hear the best. Bishop, right? There's no doubt I hear an it. Is there anywhere else where you, that you have a doubt that you hear? Yeah, that's the one. So what's your perfect recording for that one? Bishop. Bishop? Looks like Bishop to you. <laughs> Looks like Bishop to me, but that's fine. We, we don't all have the same perfect recordings. Bishop. All right, that's the idea. I might ask for you, you for your perfect recordings later. So what was your recording for talent? Talent. Yeah, target. Target. Mm -hmm. And Bishop. Bishop. There you go. See, it's a weird thing to think, but it's a really good way to manage these weak parts of our words. Okay. Ah, so someone asked, uh, da, 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 about the word parade. So let's, they wanted us to go back to parade. And Sam, you heard the chunks par, aid. Right. There's another way you could do it. Let's put parade down. Par and aid, right? There's a whole other way we could chunk it. Somebody said they heard it a whole different way. Can you think of another way to chunk that one? Pa uh -huh. Parade. Parade. That could work too. Map it out that way. Up above. Let's hear it. A. Uh, pa and. Er. A. Uh huh. We can say that word either way. In fact, you know, when we're talking and when linguists sort of study people, sometimes we say one and sometimes we say another. It just kind of depends on the sentence and our emphasis and things like that. Um, so you can chunk it however you hear it. You just want to make sure that your chunks match what you write. And Someone asked, are those chunkings like dependent on, on the region you're from? Definitely. Different, different people will tend to chunk things differently. Have, I've been noticing a lot what the Brits do. Oh my goodness, they put accents on different syllables and they'll definitely chunk things a little differently than we would. And that's just all part of the way our language works. Pretty cool. But our, our code for it works really well. Doesn't matter how we do it. We can do it parade or per aid as, or parade as we like. Someone asked me to do another word with you. Let me see how they wanted it done. They wanted certain, certain and worry. So let's do those two. And then we better go on to the rest of the lessons. So, so what's the first chunk you hear in certain? Sir. Sir. Go ahead and map that one out. Let's hear each sound. Er. Sir. And what's the next chunk? Uh. Exactly. Uh. And what sound is that that you hear right there? Eh. Eh. Yeah. You, you'll see that eh is said. Many people are surprised to think of that as eh. But we do use that for eh quite commonly. And I think part of what makes this one a little challenging is many of us say this with a schwa sound. It sounds more like certain. In, in quick speech. Mm -hmm. And so it's maybe a, a schwa de way eh. I don't think any of us really say a there though. Certain, I am certain of it. Maybe over in the UK, I'm not sure. But um, I think that just depends on our speech, but this is definitely a way we do eh. And you would want a perfect recording of certain so that you can hear that eh and remember to write that picture, that very unusual picture of eh. Okay. The other one they were worried about was worried. So what's the first chunk you hear in worried? What? That's the first sound. What's the first chunk of sounds? Were. Were, good. So do that one over here. Sound by sound. Were. So say each one for me. Whoop. Were. No, what was just that one? Mm -hmm. what, uh, what, what, what do you hear after what? 
what in were were nothing were and er er so oh, or. yes this is an unusual way to do er we'll see this way to do er quite a bit and some people like to think of it as just this er with a double or maybe it's just another another way to do er that we don't see very often you definitely want to get a good look at that one that er to get where it's about going and you next time e that works there's another way that could work but that one works just fine all right okay that covers the questions people had just right at that moment now one of the lessons you want to do a lot of is just reading and mapping multi-syllable words that don't have visual stops in them that's what we were already doing when we analyzed these words you know gopher and hammer um so i don't think you need to see us do that it would just be quickly reading it and mapping it in chunks and make sure her chunks match and she'll be doing a lot of copying i found that it was interesting when i first started doing these lessons i was surprised with the amount of copying that we did the word would be in front of them and they'd be splitting it into chunks and copying it there but boy was that valuable time and something we don't do a lot of i don't think anymore one person did have a question about the split so with hammer you wrote ham and you thought about stopping there right mm -hmm. and then you were going to put this here why didn't you because you stopped me <laughs> oh you noticed yeah i said oh there was more to it didn't i yeah if we put m mm here and Hammer. we put m mm here, Ham that would mean there's two different m mm sounds. Yeah, hammer, hammer. But when we say the word, remember we're starting with what we say. When we say hammer, we only say one m mm sound, and we find it's much easier to spell if you keep its picture together. You're going to notice it better. Okay, so we're only going to write m mm in one place. Right. And we'll keep it together that way. So it is a big break from the way we traditionally split syllables, right? But remember, we're not working in syllables. We're working in chunks of sounds that we hear and getting the whole chunk written down and just working our way through the word in a quick, quick process. All right. Okay, there we go. The next lesson is the book in the book is looking at special endings. So Samantha, I think we've talked about special endings in the past, right? Um, but let me review it just a little bit for them. So some words have a chunk in them that never got written in English. They were borrowed from Latin or borrowed from Greek, and we still just write them in, in those same spellings. They don't sound like like we would expect those letters to sound and the chunk that we hear <laughs> we don't write it the way that we say it so i know you know the chunk shun right here's another one though um i thought this one would be interesting for you do you know what chunk that is sure oh you do oh wow you learned more that's good <laughs> You've been learning it as you're reading words, huh? Yeah, that's shus. When you see it, you just say shus. If we wrote it in English, we would say shh uh, in the English sound pictures, right? And we have to remember when we hear this chunk to write that. And when we see that, we have to remember to say shus, okay? So let's read some words with, with shus. And there are, looks like two or three different ways to do shus actually on our list. Um, and this word, some of these are hard. I don't know if you've ever heard this word before. So this will be good for them to see how we, how we attack it. Because <laughs> you recognize those right away. <laughs> sure. Which one did you recognize? Nutrius. Ah, now when you said nutrius. Nutrius. You said nutri, and then you said Nutritious. So this is Nutritious, shush. wow. <laughs> yes, very good. I'm when really you act smart <laughs> when you read you are smart. you are you just haven't been trained to read in chunks that's all right and to read each chunk 
and to really think about what each one is. You're, you're reading by what you, you know, bits of words and how you know that many of them go together. But if you read your chunks really carefully, you're going to get a lot more read. So this was nutritious, not nutritious. Let's see why. Because new tree us would have us at the ending instead of shus. Yeah. How about this word above it? Delicious. Mm -hmm. Delicious. Let's split that one in chunks over here. And we need three spots. So you can just do it up above here. What's the first chunk? D. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's really bad what I was trying to do while I was. <laughs> you did great. That's delicious. Uh, above it, three chunks, two nutritious. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Now let's try one more word on the list. This one you probably have never heard. So let's just do the best we can. We can chunks, right? Pre Precautious. Precautious, which you sounds think like I've it never could heard be it? You've heard cautious, but, no, heard precautious. but pre precautious isn't a word. It isn't? Mm -mm. But no. I feel like I've heard it before. Because you've heard cautious. But right? I, okay. So let's see what else these letters could be spelling, right? This could be pre, or that could be e. Try either. Precautious. Precautious. Very good. I and don't get that. And don't get stuck on all. This can be other things, and it's not all in this word. Precocious. Uh huh. That's the word, precocious. And you probably have never even heard of it, so you wouldn't be able to recognize it from your choices, right? But we can learn to learn to be ready for different chunks and practicing different chunks. Precocious means very smart and advanced for your age. <clears throat> That's precocious. So let's map out the chunks of precocious. Pre mm -hmm. co mm -hmm. Is that the hair got on there. Um, you may have noticed she's not saying each sound anymore, and I'm not making her. We're we're shifting into mapping out blended chunks of sounds and getting more fluent there. And in the book, it teaches you how to do that, how to how to encourage them to map now more fluently like she's been doing right here. All right, that's how we deal with special endings. Okay. And the last lesson I wanna show you before we move on to other things is multi-syllable. You see that multi-syllable process spelling. So this is the culmination of it. We're gonna be looking at words analyzing them and then I'll ask her to spell them afterwards. So let me pick a word from here. Um, let's read this one. What's your first chunk here, Samantha? Core. Core. And your, core. And your next chunk? Quarrel. Mm -hmm. Quarrel, like a fight. Yeah. You're gonna have a quarrel. We're gonna spell this in a little bit. So let's think about spelling it. Quarrel. So, oh, you notice that it looks a little more like quar, right? Because we say quar and it's pretty weak in there. So quar. Yeah. Uh -huh. Now in quar, let's do each sound. Let's think about each sound. What's, what's the first sound? Qu. Qu. Good. And what's the next sound? Uh. And then? Uh. Quar. Any of those that you'll need to notice to spell later? I think you'll need to notice the er. Make sure to write that for the oh, er, yeah. right? Any other ones? I think qu, you'll just write qu when you hear it. And what the ah you were going to deal with with the uh, perfect recording, right? You're going to say quar. quar. Yeah. Okay. What's your next chunk? L. U. It's just u, isn't it? Yeah. And so get a good look at the picture of u. You won't have that word spelled correctly if you don't use that u, right? So that one you just want to get a good look at and a good look at your room. And a little later, I'll ask you to spell that one, okay? But before we do that, let's spell some of the words that we've been noticing and looking at already. 
let's spell the word talent. Do you remember your perfect recording? Talent. Oh, very nice. So map it out from that. And let's see how it looks on paper or on whiteboard after you get your drink of water. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. So what was your recording in for talent? Ta ta uh, yeah, tau and talent. Does it look right? Do you think you think it? Yeah. You want to try any options, or are you going to go with that option? We're going to go with that one. You're going to go with it, and you're going to get it right. Very nice job. I know how to spell talent because in like fifth grade, my password to get in my computer was eighty-five. Talent, oh, that's right. So. Another word we looked up with, at was bishop. Do you remember your perfect recording for bishop? Tell me the recording first. Bishop. Bishop, map it from that. B -e -o. Bishop. Good. Do you like how it looks? Do you want to write it together to see how it looks together? Good. Looks good. If it didn't look good, I just encourage you to try try sound spelled differently and see if they look better but you had it that was bishop that one, so that... um if you need to i'll tell you but right now what did we uh, study quarrel what was your cover recording for quarrel 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 okay let's hear the sounds as you do it <laughs> Uh, oh, very nice. You remember what the R looked like, right? It was a good thing we got a good look at it. You even said it in your perfect recording, but you didn't use it, right? I think you were focusing on the A, ah, which is what you really wanted to. And this one, you needed to remember what it looked like more, what that one looked like. And you did. Beautiful job. That's multi-syllable process spelling. And at this point, you should just do a lot of that, a whole lot with words they're reading, they're spelling words from school, all kinds of things. Samantha, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. We're all done. Let me switch the camera here. Do you want to say goodbye to everybody? Because this is our last meeting. <laughs> Thanks again, Sam. You're welcome. Bye. They might want to say bye to the puppy very quickly, very quickly, because I have other things to cover, including dealing with small groups and things. She's very proud of her little puppy, though. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So that is the multisyllable level, but I don't, we're not done. I still have some things that I wanted to go over. Um, and I'll look closely at the at the chat. It looks like we can. Um, we can deal with that when we're doing the, um, the discussion at the end. But I wanted to um, look at the rest of the book with you really quickly and then think about classroom and small group and, and training and that sort of thing before we open it up to the general discussions. So there's an ch afterward chapter okay. and It gives you an idea of, the, of where you want to go from here after you finish those lessons. If you can get your child to be proficient with the skills and the strategies that we just looked at at the multisyllable level, they're primed. They have what they need to tack words, right? And they don't need to put a lot of their attention and their cognitive um, awareness into it once they get comfortable with it. And then they can be paying attention to what they're actually reading, to the meaning, constructing the meaning, making the movie in their head of the information, right? So your goal with in the Reading Reflex book is to get them proficient with this, all the skills and the strategies taught and have them working with the sound pictures enough that they have about 80% of the code to build upon, 
So you can give them the post test, the pre test as a post test, and see if their code knowledge is now up at eighty percent. At when they have those things, and they're they should be able to read now, right? Be able to read whatever they need to read. But that doesn't mean that they naturally will. <laughs> Some kids are going to need to practice and need encouragement to practice. Okay, so. In the book, they recommend that once you've finished the lessons with your child, that you keep going, that you have them reading out loud to you at least 30 minutes a day until they're age 10 or they've been reading really well for about a year. Um, so they, they recommend that you just keep working in the same location where you had set up for your lessons, uh, that nothing has changed just because you did the last lesson in the book, right? You're going to be reading together and you're going to mix in lessons as you see things are needed as you do that reading together. Okay. They say to, you can get a little looser with it about where and where you read and things like that when your child is reading at a level that you would hope for. Right. But until then, just keep going with your lessons. But now your lessons are reading together. And they had a note about reading material and they encourage you to split pretty evenly between challenging reading and easy reading. Uh, for challenging reading, they, they encourage you reading the, the classics, you know, things that are very challenging these days. I, I don't think most of the literature that's being read in classes is preparing kids for the true classics. Uh, the sentence, are so long, the vocabulary is sophisticated. I don't, you know, when you pull out Winnie the Pooh, the real book and ask a kid to read it, oh man, there's a lot of challenge there and it's, it's but it's so rewarding, but it's challenging. So you're going to want to let them know, right? This is tough, but I'm gonna be here, right? We'll take turns. And you encourage them to take their time and be patient with themselves. They want to read fast, but we don't get fast that way <laughs> just by going faster, right? Okay. Note in the book about comprehension. So reading speed and accuracy are very important components of comprehension, the critical components of comprehension. And that's been our first step with the length, with the reading reflex book, right? Is to build that comprehension. Build through building reading speed and building uh, accuracy. But at this point, when you've gotten to this point in the reading reflex book and your reading reflex program with your child, you finish the lessons, but you're reading a lot together you should start addressing other important components of reading and oral comprehension, okay? If needed, if your child really needs those, okay? Some of them at this point have everything they need and, and you're, you won't need to delve into those things. Um, you can let those happen in the classroom. But other components of oral comprehension and reading comprehension, an important one is vocabulary. I wanted to point out that it doesn't mention in the book, but reading volume is actually the biggest factor in this, which is surprising. You know, it's not, it's not exposure. It's not talking to your kids. It's not having conversations with adults. It's reading volume. So read, read, read now, right? And it doesn't, it's interesting. The studies show it doesn't really matter what they're reading. Um, the reading level or the material doesn't matter. It can, it can be very unsophisticated. It can be Captain Underpants. <laughs> it can be comic books. It can be simple kids' stories. It's reading volume, okay? And of course, there are other components that some children are not getting enough of and really need some, some attention to. There is a book that the McGinnis is the authors of Reading Reflex wrote called Language Wise. Um, and if you've been using the, the sound to symbol to meaning workbooks that 
I recommended that can go alongside the Reading Reflex book. They actually incorporate language-wide activities in there as you go. It's mixed in with the decoding and the encoding work. So you would already have started addressing some of these. So at this point, if you needed to continue, you could get that, the, the book. Um, it's called How to Increase Your Child's Verbal Intelligence, the language-wise method. I really like the lessons in there. They provide excellent opportunities for just dis little discrete reading and writing assignments. And in those, you can continue to train the correct reading and spelling processes. Um, for those of the, those children who just need a lot of training and maintenance. And I wanted to point out that if your child is much older, like older than 10, and they have a lot of words memorized, you might be wanting some lists with more challenging words than you would, you're finding in Reading Reflex. So we have a kit just for them. It's the Silver Lining Teen Literacy Kit. And if you're working with a child of that age, I would recommend going through Reading Reflex, but do it very quickly. Just you know, looking at everything, introducing everything, talking about how these are simple words and we're seeing how to work with them. And then now would be the time to launch into the lessons in the, in the um, teen literacy kit if you were wanting to get more of a challenge in there. Okay, so that's Reading Reflex, the parent program. And I did promise that I would talk a little bit about phonographics and how it's different and how we use it for educators, right? So, and also think about small groups and how that might look. Uh, phonographics is actually laid out in, differently for educators in our certification kit and in the training that we have. The program for teachers parallels reading reflex, but it takes things to a lot greater depth and includes more challenging material. The training and the materials there also show you how to move more quickly and efficiently than you do in reading reflex. In Reading Reflex, they wanted to make sure parents didn't make any mistakes, miss anything that was really critical. So they told them, start on page one, do every lesson, every word list, right? Um, but we don't do that in phonographics when we're working. Um, we don't do every single lesson. We don't do every single word list like you would in Reading Reflex. So we, do, we move through and we train you how to do that in a more efficient way. So there are different ways that people use different educators in different settings. One is the, a clinical setting um, where you're working one-on-one -on -one, um, and things do move quickly. When you're working this way, typically you meet weekly or bi-weekly for an hour, hour-long sessions. And ideally you're having the parents do some review and practice uh, about 45 minutes in between the sessions using the parent support books. And it's not gonna look much different from the reading reflex flex lessons you saw in terms of how you're working with the student and the word lists and, and those kinds of things. But the pacing is going to be very pretty quick um, because typically we can remediate a student in six to 12 of these hour long sessions. That's fast. Some students are gonna need a little longer, uh, but most will remediate within 24 hour long sessions. And I'm just finishing up right now uh, a rewrite of our extended student manual. And that would show educators exactly what to do during the, the additional time for the kids who need a little longer. Okay. Other people are using phonographics in like pullout programs or, or something like that in a support type classroom. And they bring the kids together and they work in small groups, okay? And the lessons, again, wouldn't look too much different from what you've already been seeing in Reading Reflex. You would have the kids around a table, right? It's nice to have those kidney tables like they have in classrooms where you can reach all the way across and you're across from the kids. And I, I really like to just have my board and my little words to build 
in front of us all. And I call on different kids to do different parts, right? And we're all listening and they all have a piece of paper to map on when we're done. That way we're all focused in the same place. Um, but I do know there are many teachers who like to just um, create five sets of the word building and hand each student one. And we're all building the word and they're all pulling down their own word as they build it. The, the timing and pacing basically is the same as the one-on-one -on -one when you're working with small groups. Um, you might need to take a little longer because it's just not quite as efficient. No one's been seeing my, my videos, my, my things, have they? Wait a minute. Let me make sure that I've shared this with you. Okay, so supposedly you can see my, my slides now. Yep, we can see it now. Oh, okay, good. And you weren't seeing it before, right? No, we weren't. Oh, I'm so sorry. Let me see if there's one. Well, hopefully you were able to follow me. So I was talking about comprehension. This is the one I think that maybe you would wanna see that there's a lot of different elements that go into comprehension. And a book like Language Wise will cover these different kinds of elements. Very sorry about that. And then I showed you the verbal intelligence book and the, um, the teen literacy kit. And then I started talking about phonographics for educators. So I don't think we missed too much on the slides. So, and, and then I had the slide here about the clinical one-on-one -on -one setting and how often we might meet. And now I'm on this one. So, oops, but you are seeing my notes, right? You don't need my notes. That's what you need to see. All right, so I was saying that in a small group, you, you basically do keep the same pacing going and um, you can get through the program if you're meeting with students um, about two hours total a week and people split it up in different ways. It doesn't seem to make a difference on how you split up the time. Um, and you can maybe expect to be done in about six months with most students. And you might also plan in your, in your year then some additional time for extended therapy for just a few of the students who were gonna need that. And in the training, we actually look at a diagnostic test, the diagnostic test and how to use that to predict students who are gonna need more time at the end. So you, you'll know that, and you'll also know it as you're working with them that they're gonna need some extended time with you. Okay. Now, thinking about phonographics in a classroom, when this is the main program used to teach reading and spelling, the instruction in a classroom is gonna look pretty different from what we've seen in the Reading Reflex book because you're gonna do a mix of whole class instruction and then small group work that's gonna look like the Reading Reflex lessons. You wanna plan for about, I said two hours a week for the year. It might just be better to think about it 20 minutes a day, right? That you, you'll wanna spend in your mix of whole class and small group instruction. So, oh, I'm missing the page in my notes, but that's okay. Let me do this. Okay, you all can see my notes too. Sorry about that. So when you get a certification kit, you're gonna find a manual that's devoted to implementing these same lessons that we've just looked at, but in a format designed for larger groups with presentation up on a board. And it might be in person or it might even be virtual, you know, for remote instruction. There'll be a whole manual with each lesson that you've seen shown in that format. And we use those lessons to lay out the nature of the code for every student, for every type of student. That would be your tier one instruction. Whole class lessons, about 20 minutes a day. And your focus is laying out the logics of our code 
that are really accessible to everybody. And the lesson plans there in that manual have a ton of extensions that you can use for seat work. You can use them to set up centers. You can have them working independently. They can work in little groups together to review and to practice these things, something that you've just taught, or to let them delve into things like visualization and grammar and, and uh, vocabulary, those sorts of things. Okay. But one thing to be aware of, about 25% of the population does not naturally notice the sounds in words or ac accurately segment and blend them without some explicit instruction. And they will get some of that instruction that they're going to need in the whole class lessons. But some of them are going to need more than the others do. Okay. So that's why we have um, tier two instruction that we do also. And in that, we would meet in small groups and do lessons from the other manual, which is the clinical lesson plan manual. That one looks remarkably like reading reflex, but it's written for educators and has some more activities and harder lists and things. Those less lessons are done in the small group with the manipulatives as I talked about. And you bring back just the kids who are gonna need that extra time to focus on skill development and on any of the, the concepts or strategies that they missed in the whole class instruction earlier. You wanna meet, if you can just arrange to meet them twice a week for 10 to 15 minutes, you can make a big difference. And you can do the bulk of your teaching in, in the tier one time, but then the tier two time is just helping them with these things that are gonna make it all go better for them. And those groups can be a little bigger. They can be like five or six kids. They can be heterogeneous. They can be flexible. Okay. In fact, they're, they're best when they are that way. Now, finally, about 10% of the population experiences real difficulty in acquiring these sound processing skills of segmenting, manipulating, blending. They have severe phonological challenges. And those students may need even more additional work, right? And benefit from even smaller group sizes and more homogenous groupings. But many teachers are able to provide that in the classroom too. Um, they can, if you aim to meet twice a week for 10 to 15 minutes with these very, very small groups or even one-on-one -on -one when you can arrange it, you can make a huge difference for a kid who's really struggling in the classroom like that. Other schools are having interventionalists, interventionalists, that's hard to say, um, take on the tier three instruction. But I want you to keep in mind when you have those kids, it's hard to get through to them, but the research shows that phonographics is one of the few programs proven to actually be able to do that. So just have faith and know they just need more time and they need more attention and they can get it too. And if they're getting their tier one instruction in the classroom, that's the same approach and the same language and the same strategies, man, is that powerful. They don't have any conflicting approach to sift through. And in, if the teacher is giving the tier one instruction in phonographics, well, then that teacher is trained and can guide them to decode and to encode properly during math, right? Um, and to provide code knowledge when they need it and to offer the proper uh, error corrections when they're trying to read the word gymnastics, right, in, in PE. <laughs> so it, it's a very powerful thing when the classroom teacher understands the methodology and she is extending the, the learning into the other, other classes outside of the reading time. I have just two more. I promised to talk just a tiny bit about the certification training for those of you. We have an online course that is self-paced. It's available anywhere, anytime. And we've got participants all around the world. When you look at the pricing, it includes the certification kit. And in the course, you're gonna work with students learning by doing the lessons, and from the feedback that I'll give you on your lesson reports. So I'll be 
walking with you the whole way as you work through with your first students. There's a substantial volume discount for groups. And oh, many people ask how long it takes. It takes about 30, 25 to 30 hours, I think, to get through. It's self-paced though. So some people go quicker and some people take longer. And you'll learn how to do tier one, two, and three instruction with any age with that in that course, okay? There is a live course too. It's in person. It's typically done over four days. And a few trainers are out there who offer courses open to anybody. Uh, the only one currently scheduled on the books is in June in Maryland. Um, it's just it with COVID and traveling and all, everything, and people haven't been wanting to do in-person trainings much. But you can have a trainer that could come to conduct that course on site. And if you, you have a site that's looking at, at adoption, the, I think the best plan is to have a pilot team at your school get certified, uh, probably through the online course would be the best, best approach. And then have the, that pilot team apply for licensure to conduct the trainings on site. And you'll find information on both of those options at the website. And I'm gonna send out or ask Nancy to send out a page with um, the link to that. And um, when she sends out the evening's recordings. And um, in that, I also put in the coupon codes and things. Like I offered $250 off the online course for your group, for example. All right, I think I am done with all my slides and we even have time. So let's open it up to discussions and things. And I'll let Sam know that you like her puppy and that you thanked her. Okay, so someone said, I've been trying some of the lessons with small groups, all separate materials. In a school setting, you would recommend using reading reflex with students one-on-one -on -one or, or in a small group, okay? So in a school setting, I would recommend trying out the lessons with reading reflex, but if you're going to do a lot of work with students, I, I really think you would want that classroom uh, manual that tells you how to work with a bigger group and then also how to work one-on-one -on -one or in small groups. So you really want that flexibility and you'd want the, um, the diagnostics and the trainings from that. But it, I think it just depends. You're asking how you'd want to group them up and it depends on how many kids you have and how much time you have. So making the most impact might be great to meet with the whole group right? So you can get more kids in um, several times and then meet with smaller groups as well during the week to have a big impact on them. Um, okay. And someone wrote, it's rare that the classroom curriculum matches the intervention curriculums. Yes, it is very rare, but that's what we need, right? Every kid deserves speech to print instruction and instruction that's proven to work for everybody. They all deserve it. And the kids who need intervention need it the most, right? And if, we're, if our intervention method has speech to print and they're really benefiting from it, it's great. But then you throw them back into some other conflicting approach that's, that's now print to speech, rule-based, everything's happening. It's, it's really confusing and difficult for them. So I think that's a real switch we need to make. I know at my, um, one of the local schools here, they didn't want their classroom curriculum to match their intervention curriculum. And I just don't understand why. Can, it didn't make sense to me. But you'll see in lots of, like Kilpatrick, for example, um, in his book, he talks about that and says, it's important, you know, we don't have to have different instruction in these two places. We really don't. What we need to do is provide more time for the kids who need more time, right? And more individualized instruction for the kids who need more individualized, individualized instruction, but they don't need different instruction as long as the instruction is guaranteed to, to address them. 
Someone asked, has the program been used successfully with ELL, English language learners? Oh, yes. People are using it all around the world for English language learners. Um, it, it has those stimulus pictures that can help when you're building words, then it helps to build the vocabulary or support the vocabulary as they go. There isn't a lot of direction that the kid has to understand, right? Imagine trying to learn English from all these rules when you don't understand English very well. And so much of the lessons when you get very good at them are just, you're directing them with your fingers. You don't have to say much and they can really just focus on the sounds and the words and, and the vocabulary that they're learning there. And I know that over in South Africa, for example, um, a woman named Jenny Taylor who's doing amazing work at Read for Africa. Years ago, she did her master's on using phonographics with ELL students over there. So she trained some of the teachers, most of whom were second or third language English learners themselves. And she found they, they were providing instruction to the kids and, the, and the, the progress the kids made was equivalent to her instruction. It didn't matter. So it, it's quite flexible in that way. Someone says, do you have special techniques or tips for virtual tutoring? Yeah, a lot of people are having to do virtual tutoring right now. And um, a document camera is great so, because you can be, be showing students and then you can be asking them to do something equivalent in their room, right? With, their, with theirs. Uh, also, you can use the virtual whiteboard that um, you can find in things like Zoom. And um, the classroom word work manual works perfectly for that. It's already written for putting everything up on a board, writing it on a board and working that way. So just doing that virtually then is just simple with, the, with that classroom word work manual. Okay, we still have time. Is there anything else you guys wanna see or talk about? And any questions I missed? If I missed a question earlier on, just let me know now. You missed my question. Oh, what was it? <laughs> okay, so I was asking, you know, sometimes in some programs, uh, you, you get training and then you're kind of out there on your own. And I wanted to know what kind of support does your training program provide for those of us that are thinking of getting trained uh, mm -hmm. via virtual, which is probably what I would do. Mm -hmm. And um you know, once you're out there uh, doing small groups, which is what I will focus on and use this with, uh, mm -hmm. program with, um, what support do you offer? Uh, should I have any questions? And uh, yeah. B, do you, do you, as an educator, do you follow a lesson plan format or is it like the reading reflex book where the lesson is, uh, the lesson is given to you and you just use minimal words? Um, and just straightforward uh, demonstration. Yeah, I think um, it's more like the reading reflex book, right? And it's very student driven, you know, depending on their performance is what you're going to pick to do next. So we, you know, that's why we don't have like a preset lesson plan that says on day one, do this with this activity, this activity, this activity, because a lot of it depends what you do next depends on how that student had or group of students had performed, right? Um, as for support, well, as you're taking the course, you, you're working with a student or a group of students and you're reporting on those and you're in, in communication with me about them. I'm the one who, read all, who reads all the lesson reports and gives feedback. So as you're learning it there, I'm there answering questions and you can email me and um, we can set up little individual Zoom meetings to go over something quickly if you need me to. And when you're done, that doesn't have to stop. I'm still around and available via email, available via Zoom. And then um, I also am in the, in the midst of developing more continuing education, little, little uh, meetings and groups for um, phonographics practitioners. Currently, there is a, a membership for phonographics uh, um, practitioners that you can join if you're certified. And there you'll have access to um, demonstration videos and um, review videos. One that's up there, for example, is um, an hour long presentation of the multisyllable level. 
with a student and discussion with a teacher. And um, you'd have access to that, for example, as part of your membership. And I'm looking to develop more of those and have those available to generally to anybody who wants to see them. Does that answer everything you had wondered about? Is there an additional cost then for the membership? Yes. There's a, a yearly fee, it's $55 right now. And when you have access to that membership, there is a whole section of the website that you can get to, and you can go preview it now if you want. And you look in the members section, and you'll see there's instructional videos. There's also a whole, whole huge list of downloadable PDFs that you have unlimited access to that are worksheets that go along with each of the lessons. So it's, it's great. You can go, you're, at, you're doing advanced code, uh, work, you can go print out the word list, you're doing um, adjacent consonant word building, you can go and there are four or five different worksheets that you could print out for a review or homework that you have access to. Okay, someone asked about mem working memory issues. Is there anything differently you do? Um, no. It, that's been built into this, right? What we do is different and it's in order to address working memory issues. Not every kid has working memory issues, but they can benefit from the approach anyway. So you won't need to do anything different it, except for doing the lessons the way that they're set up, right? Some of that, thank you. You're welcome, Nora. Aaron, I was looking yeah. for the the classroom word, word work manual. What does it look like? It's it's only available as part of the certification kit. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Um, for what I do, I'm too small for that. <laughs> yeah, you don't need a whole kit if you if you're just you're working with your with your um, grandson. Is that right? Uh, no, I work with dyslexic students, mm -hmm. but. I tutor privately, so I only have 11, so. Oh, you only have 11. Well, you, you might find actually a great deal of use <laughs> for that. Yeah, well, what I mean is expenditure-wise. Oh, yeah. Because some of them I don't charge, and so mm -hmm. it's, you know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Wonderful program, though. I love it. Yeah, yeah. I, I think you can get by a great deal with, with the um, Reading Reflex book, and... Yeah. Um, and if you can ever afford it later, the certification kit, I think you, you will really like because the materials are, are nice. They're, they're photographs and their color. And the classroom word work manual just has a lot of extension ideas that can give you fun things to do. I'm sure I would love it. <laughs> Maybe Christmas or something. Maybe so. <laughs> oh, and members, members can get, a, get discounts on kits. So, okay. Anything else? Well, here's Nancy back. Thank you so much for your time with this book study. And Donna asked me to remind you that the videos will be available in, on the YouTube channel in the photographics playlist. And we will um, get the email sent out with the links and the last link to the video. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. I appreciate your time and your attention. And, and I am available if you need me. You know, if you have questions, feel free to email me. Uh, it'll be in the links. So um, I look forward to hearing from you. And, I, and just let me know how things are going with your kids, too. I always love to hear success stories or challenges. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. Take care, everybody. Have a great, great night.